Now I'd like to welcome our last Ignite of the day, of the year really, Mike Penniger from Chemical Abstracts. He's an engineer, a software engineer at Chemical Abstracts, is going to be talking about how to dockerize your build tool chain. <laughs> It'll be a really cool talk. Please welcome Mike. And I did forget to mention, very rudely, I, I, my short-term memory is kind of tricky up here. It, it, it may be difficult to see some things, but we will publish the slides, and there's some things you can learn in the details of the slides. Thanks again. Here's Mike. Yeah, so I definitely recommend you grab the slides offline or online after the talk, because there's going to be a lot of information on there that you want to look at uh, up close and not try and write down. So uh, my name is Michael Pinniger. I work at Chemical Abstracts. Uh, we do DevOps for a large group of developers there on the main project. And we try and make them go fast. So we focus on uh, you know, continuous integration and, and their workflows. Uh, at night, I work for Sasquatch Technology. We're a consulting firm focusing on providing DevOps services. Um, so the talk I'd like to give today is about dockerizing your build tool chain. And that's the, the essentially what you want to do is take everything that you would use to build your product and put it into a Docker image. And so that when your developers are building their product, they're not relying on what's on their VM. They're relying on what's inside this Docker container. So why would you do that? Well, one of the reasons is flexibility. So if you've ever tried to manage multiple versions of Ruby, multiple versions of Groovy, some, some kind of uh, library like that, you'll find that it's quite difficult. Now, there are tools out there to help you to do that, but not every uh, application that you want to use has that tool. So Docker lets you package those up in an agnostic way. Um, the other thing is that it lets you reduce your dependency management at the VM level. So you're not trying to install all these dependencies on your VM. Instead, you're providing them as a Docker to your developers so that they can go immediately. Consistency is also really important. So this provides you a build environment that does not vary from VM to VM. You get an immutable Docker, and it just works. And that's something that's pretty important if you've ever had to try and troubleshoot one VM versus the other. Um, this is something I think that people don't really think about. When you have an uh, application, a lot of times you'll do things like change Java versions or change Ruby versions. And if you try and go back and build those old cold code versions, you'll find that you can't do it without breaking your environment. So versionability is very important. The, uh, and the, putting it in a Docker helps with that. Uh, this also lowers barriers to entry. So if you're trying to get on to somebody else's project and build their product and help them out, when they can just give you a Docker, you can get going immediately, and you don't have any, uh, anything standing in your way. So why wouldn't you want to do this? It's always very important to consider that. So I like to call this weirdness, and that's that when you put stuff into a Docker, you get these unexpected results. In this case, we see that the output of LS is not highlighted when it's inside the container. It's also not free. So installing Maven is a well-understood process if you just follow the directions on the website. Putting it inside a Docker means that you're on the hook for understanding all the nuances of what that application needs. So you've got to pay for it every, <laughs> every inch. Um, the way that you do this is that you have three different things. Each project has a Docker file, and the Docker file is going to contain the dependencies that you need. So it's going to be like Ruby and any uh, binaries that you might have. And then you're going to have an env.sh. And what that's going to do is that's going to invoke Docker with all the different um, things that you want to pass into it. And you're also going to have something called E. In this case, it's just a shell script that lives on your path. And it understands how to find the env.sh and invoke it. So the E shell script, this is the first part of it. It's going to look up. So it's going to find the env.sh. And it's going to make sure that it gets invoked with the correct path. Because what we want to do is we want to make this transparent to the developers so that when they run their shell script, uh, or when they run their, their command, they would type E, space, and then their normal command, and it'll just get inv invoked. The next part of the shell script obviously passes the command off to the, uh, to the env.sh, which invokes it using the Docker. I'll wait here, yeah. Um, so one thing that you need to do is you need to make sure that you get the right Docker for the right type of your code. So in this case, what we've got is a project that's managed by Maven. This part would be different depending on what your project is. Um, we're using this to read the palm file to get the version so that we get the right Docker. Um, so here, we're using the git root to mount the user's uh, the data directory for their project inside the Docker. 
we get the version from the read version from the previous slide, and we add them to all the groups that they were outside the container. Uh, this is the docker run command. Remove true just makes sure that we don't end up with a docker laying around after the invocation. The net, net host makes sure that we join the uh, same network that the host is, so it seems like you're on the same uh, computer. Uh, we also mount the same user. And uh, so the X11 Unix socket, that's done so that if a, a computer application like Chrome prop pops up inside the application, inside the Docker, you get to see it. Um, we're going to volume out the Etsy password and Etsy group so that you get those groups internally. And uh, we're also going to mount the time, uh, so local time, time zone, so that they're the same time zone inside. And the, the Docker sock, I think, is probably one of the most important things in the slide. That basically makes it so that if you're inside a container, you can still make other Docker containers. They'll just get made as siblings instead of children. And this is our final slide. This is what a Docker file would look like. Um, if you look through the slides earlier, there's a link to a uh, presentation, or a link to a, a repo that has all these files in it, so that you can go and try this out for yourself. This would be a Docker file for a project with Maven and NPM. Uh, finally, Sasquatch Technology, that's, that's who I'm here for. That's it. Thanks for your time. <laughs>